I'm from the College um, State University of New York system at the College of Oneana, and I'm actually presenting research that was formulated through some work that I did as a um, began as a master's project, and then it morphed into something that I hope to better meet the needs of the local people um, on Andros and the greater islands in the Bahamas. And so this talk is titled Crab Pen Survey and Harvest Analysis of the Land Crab, Cardisoma Gonhumi Fishery in the Bahamas. Um, and this is actually co-authored with one of my undergraduate research students. So the land crab is found throughout most of the Atlant Central Atlantic and Southern Atlantic regions. Um, primarily in the Bahamas, Central America, and along the coastal estuarine regions of South America. There are several large species of land crabs that are harvested as fishery resources, including the white crab, as it's known in the Bahamas, and also the black crab. So the white crab is the G. Carcinus, Cardisoma guanhumi, black crab is G. Carcinus ruricola. So both of these crabs are found um, pretty predominantly throughout the islands, and the black crab, which is actually not part of the study, there's actually less known about the black crab um, fishery than the white crab, although it's my understanding that it's not, they're not differentiated in any of the data that's been um, collected to date. One of the reasons that the land crab is so readily available as a fishery resource is they have a spring spawning migration, and that's when many of the large males and females are harvested. They actually breed in the springtime when the rains come, and then they migrate towards the sea where the females will then release their eggs, um, they'll release their eggs into the ocean. There are some very serious issues going on with, um, between harvest pressure and habitat loss. So many locals are able to harvest the land crabs at a commercial rate of more than 400 individuals per evening. Um, additionally, there is evidence that there are some very intensely harvested areas on North Andros. Additional threats to the land crab population include habitat loss. So again, this is a species where many, all stages of the life cycle are tied to a specific habitat. And so when mangroves are removed, as we can see here, this is actually Standard Creek, um, those mangroves were removed to build a resort, you lose a lot of very important um, estuaries for nurseries, not only of land crab, but of many marine and coastal species. Additionally, with the input of roads, juvenile and adult habitat is taken out, and this is actually the road to, um, this is the road to Sandy Creek on South Andros. Uh, in addition to a lot of this, this is, you know, a decline. Um, Gardner found this in 2008, that there's a 90% decline over the last 40 years. Other contributors to the land crab population decline is certainly with the advent of Crab Fest. Um, this festival was started in the late 1990s as a way to bring increased tourist revenue to Central Andros. Um, again, a huge economic boom for the local communities. This has now grown into a two to three day festival that brings more than 20,000 people to the Bahamas. And a lot of the tourists that come here are local tourists. They're people that have moved off island or um, other Bahamians that want to come because it is such an amazing heritage festival. It's almost like a homecoming for Androsians. And so, um, being able to have this highly important um, heritage festival that celebrates the very long and rich history of the land crab harvest on Andros is incredibly important to the local economy. One of the concerns, though, is what happens if there aren't crabs for Crab Fest? Um, you know, again, with climate change, if the seasonal rains come late, the crabs might not spawn. Um, and again, this gets into a whole host of issues within um, the very cyclical nature of the land crab spawn and the timing of Crab Fest. Uh, these are all overriding concerns, and how do you determine what the best management strategy is for this very wide-ranging and hugely economically important species on one of the largest islands in the Bahamas? And so there's actually not much fishery data to be found on the land crabs within the Bahamas. There's quite a bit of um, information on the Brazilian fishery and some of the other islands throughout the Caribbean. However, what I like to think of as kind of the big four studies, um, again, there's a proceedings work that was done by Lutz and Austin. They were actually looking at using, um, starting a fishery for the land crabs to see if they could actually be farmed. Um, their data was really inconclusive. They weren't sure that it would be very profitable. Um, again, this those study was from nearly 40 years ago, and so I think a lot of their, their habitat um, 
studies should be reassessed, again, because there's potentially land use changes that have occurred in the last 30 to 40 years, which will impact where the land crabs are actually um, burrowing and spending, again, part of that seasonal migratory um, migratory spawn. Um, additionally, there were two master's theses that were more recently um, undertaken to, again, to kind of tease out what's happening with the land crab fishery, where are the needs of the local people, what's happening with the actual land crab population. Um, and and um, Vanessa Hargraves-Allen actually presented a report to Nature Conservancy, Conservancy really looking at the economic value of the land crab fishery. And so it's actually pretty pretty significant, $20 million per year um, is estimated as revenue in the land crab fishery. And it's a very, very low, um, you know, you don't have to invest a lot of money. You don't need to buy a boat. You don't have to be able to get out on the water in order to make a pretty sizable seasonal income. So the season is only about three months and it, the average harvester can make between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars within three months. So I know I know a lot of people in the U.S., um, a lot of college students that would love to make that much money during the summer. I mean, again, it's hugely important because this is how the locals will pay the light bill. They will pay for their school, their children's school uniforms, computers. They build homes, and again, it's a hugely important fishery resource. And so moving into what the needs of the people are, again, my initial project was looking at the genetic diversity of the land crabs and the harvesters, you know, as much as that's very, very interesting and important for understanding the science and the biology of the land crab, that is not what the land crab harvesters want to know. They want to know how many land crabs can they harvest and can they continue to provide for their families from harvesting the land crabs throughout the Bahamas. Um, and so, this is a very preliminary study, again, just a pilot study starting to tease out what are the sizes of the land crabs that are being harvested, what are the sex ratios. If more females are being harvested, you're potentially impacting the number of offspring that are put into um, recruitment every year. And again, looking at, you know, what sizes are the land crabs that are being harvested, are there potential populations that are under more direct pressure than other populations? Um, and the site selection that I used for both of my field seasons were based on active land crab harvesting. So none of the crabs that I actually measured were wild caught by me. They were actually harvested from local um, land crab harvesters and they were held in the crab pens. And so what this actually meant is I got to spend two field seasons in the crab pens with local harvesters, um, actually hand collecting them from the crab pens, measuring them, um, and again, really building on this idea of Keep, keeping engaged and staying engaged and keeping open dialogue with the land crab harvesters. And so um, I ended up with, I had three sites on Andros and um, two on Abaco. The one site on Abaco was actually very phenomenal crab habitat, but there wasn't any active collecting going on. Um, and my three sites on Andros, uh, one of the sites I had to drop because I actually did not have permission to go into the crab pen and measure crabs. Again, this is people's livelihood. Um, and really the collaboration and the cooperation that I have with the land crab harvesters I take very seriously. So without permission, I didn't go anywhere near their crab pens. And again, the same idea. Um, in 2015, I was able to revisit the same three sites on Andros, and then I was able to pick up another site on Abaco. And I would have to say the field assistants that I used were absolutely crucial to being able to make this happen. Um, it's pretty impossible to hold uh, the land crab and measure it at the same time. And so I utilized quite a few field, field assistants from Forfar Field Station. I also brought in um, a couple elementary age students, again, with the idea that a lot of this data can be brought into the local classroom and summer camp programs. And so when we collected the data, the, the crabs were caught in the pen, they were sexed, they were also measured. Um, we measured the length of the carapace along the midline, and that data was recorded. Um, and I did use digital calipers. This was, uh, this was purposeful to ensure that we had accurate data collection, even if the elementary age students were the ones measuring the carapace and collecting data, I was able to confirm again, proper use of the calipers, that they were zeroed out and that they were measured and that they were being read correctly. So we did a double measurement off the digital and then I double checked with the analog, um, again, for accuracy and to make sure that we get great data because I think this is a great project to, um, to bring into a lot of the summer programs. And so through the 
we had four sites each season, um, measured up to 100 crabs at each site. So we measured 363 crabs in our first field season and 215 crabs in the second season. They were, um, you know, about a third of the crabs each, um, at each site were females, except for San Sal, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And so what are we looking at for, um, again, there is a significant difference in the sizes between the males and females. Some of this could be an artifact because land crab males are larger than females. However, um, the data that I've seen doesn't actually tease out, there's no good information that says, you know, males are larger than females by X number of millimeters. That data is, I've just not been able to find that. Um, so it's unclear whether this is a sex-specific size difference or if it is potentially a site-specific size difference between males and females. Um, what is important to note, though, is that um, regardless of year, um, island, or population, that the land crabs that are being harvested in two of my sites on Andros Island are significantly smaller than any of the land crabs that are being harvested on my sites on, um, this is San Salvador, this is an Andros site, and this is um, on San Salvador. So this indicates that there is possibly heavy selection for land crabs in two very important sites um, on Andros Island, which will, you know, again, necessitate additional research in the future to really tease out if this is, you know, again, long-term studying becomes very important to understand the long-term effect of harvesting. And then the only significant difference looking from island to island is that the land crabs on Andros were significantly smaller than the land crabs on either um, Abaco or San Salvador. And looking at the sex ratio of males to females. So um, females are being harvested about a third of the time. And so this becomes important if right, the land crabs are being harvested during the spawn. So if females are being harvested either before they've spawned or while they have eggs, um, this becomes really important into what's being put out into the next, um, into the next generation of eggs and you know, potentially affects recruitment and long-term profitability of the land crab fishery. And these are just you know, histograms looking at um, basically size classes of the land crabs that are being harvested. And so these are um, the top two bar graphs are females and the bottom two are males. And what you can see for females, this is actually um, six and a half centimeters to just under eight centimeters. So this, um, a lot of the female crabs are within those size classes. Again, not very many large females. Um, are being harvested. Does that mean that they're not present in the population? Not necessarily. They're just not part of what's being harvested. Um, and again, generally the same trend for um, the females in 2015. And then additionally, the males. Um, quite a few large males are being harvested both years. But again, these very middle size classes um, are more heavily harvested. And this. Uh, I think is somewhat important because the land crab, there are no regulations for the land crab fishery within the Bahamas. And um, actually I have a research, my student researchers presenting um, a summary of the land crab management regulations throughout its range. So certainly if you have some questions, pop by the poster and you can take a look at that. But there are only two countries that have set aside any management regulations at all and catch limits. Um, and their catch limits are actually limited to only males greater than 80 millimeters of carapace length. And so if we think about, you know, again, longer trend, um, certainly, you know, none of these female crabs would be considered legal, um, and then only about a third of the males that are harvested would be considered legal size. Again, looking at some references um, to both Brazil and Dominican Republic, um, those are the only two countries that have actually set aside any size regulations. So, I'm not saying that size regulations need to happen in the Bahamas whatsoever. I'm just saying that more information and more data needs to be collected to really understand, you know, what sizes are being harvested. Um, and certainly the encouragement of not collecting females can become important. And so some of the general conclusions that I found, again, the males and females are significantly different in size. I do have two sites that I think weren't for other studies um, where they're going into those sites and actually doing um, wild cut studies, looking at the burrow size again, um, because I am looking at basically a subset of the wild population. Um, and additionally, you know, male crabs were harvested at a greater rate than female crabs, which is totally fine. Um, it's you know, again, this is how people are providing for their families. They're paying the bills. And so, again, you know, this, the analysis that I ran 
took into effect um, that there was no difference between the harvest either late in the spawn or early in the spawn. What I found was really interesting in the, two, um, the 2015 field study is that um, the local har land crab harvesters were using social media to track localized spawning events. And I would, you know, go and meet up with some of the land crab harvesters and they say, hey, did you see that video on Facebook? All the crabs are swarming on South Andros. And they said, are you going to go there? And I said, no, actually, I'm headed to San Salvador for a conference. But that would be kind of the dream, is to be able to use social media and you know, really get in touch with the local land crab harvesters and see, um, you know, go to the different sites to see some of these spawns. They're, they're pretty amazing when all of a sudden there are thousands of crabs scurrying across the road. And so when we look at land crab consumption in the Bahamas, I think this is where um, you know, potentially more research will need to be done. There's a huge difference between what's being harvested for the local market um, versus the national market. And Gardner's work in 2008, I think, is pretty, um, I don't necessarily want to say frightening, but very enlightening as to the number of crabs that are being harvested. So based on her calculations, um, if the mail boat leaves Fresh Creek twice a week and is carrying off this many land crabs, we're looking at potentially 500 to 700,000 land crabs being harvested from Andros Island every single year. And so the question becomes, yes, Andros is a huge island, there is a massive land crab population, but can it sustain harvest at those rates? Um, and this is where some of the management becomes really important. Um, so we do have land crab replenishment preserve. This is habitat. This is historical land crab harvesting habitat. This will for, the land will forever be protected, and the land will forever be able to be used for many of the local people to harvest land crabs. And so that's great. It will certainly protect the heritage um, of the land crab fishery. Additionally, with the expansion of the West Side National Park, we certainly have um, nursery habitat that's being protected. Um, as well, and certainly this very wonderful educational brochure that I bring many copies of every time I come to the Bahamas to do my research, and I distribute that to schools, and I know that a lot of other folks do that as well. Um, but this is really all there is. It's the encouragement of releasing the females and then also looking at some of the habitat protection. And so with the big picture, right, again, we need to be able to support continued harvest. This is how people are providing for their families. Um, and people need to be able to maintain their quality of life so that crabs can be harvested well into the future. And a lot of the um, ongoing and future work, again, continued community outreach. Um, I actually brought my own um, elementary age children in order to, you know, test out the idea that, you know, we can bring some of this research into the schools. I think having elementary age Bahamian school children being involved in scientific data collection and analysis is huge. It builds capacity within the local schools so that Bahamian children can grow up and be stewards of their own environment and become the next leaders of natural history management politics and local community leaders moving into the future. And I think that doing a lot of citizen science project and community outreach is the best way um, to reach the next generation of Bahamian stewards for their environment. Um, and additionally, certainly long-term population monitoring needs to happen and vulnerability assessment. I've read estimates where um, when land crabs um, in different countries, they actually lose 15% of their harvested crabs by the time they're collected and the time they reach the market. So it would be interesting to know what the um, loss rate is for the fishery once the, um, the sacks of crabs get to Nassau. And then, again, you know, the Pine Minister spoke about his development plan for Andros Island. And so, again, looking at how um, that development plan affects, you know, not only other marine species, but also, you know, taking into account the land crab habitat. And m much of the development is actually where um, the local land crab harvesters will go to harvest their crabs. And so taking all of that into the future, I have been in communication with the folks at Stanford, and I have provided um, a significant amount of data and information, basically everything that I've been able to find, so that they can present a management plan, um, again, utilizing scientific data to help infer policy, um, that certainly the Prime Minister is very much um, moving forward with plans to develop Andros Island. So um, I will continue to be involved in that as, as requested. 
And so I would like to thank um, certainly all of the land crab harvesters who have helped me, um, again, be able to participate and do a lot of this amazing research. This research is actually for them. Um, I've been traveling to Andros for longer than I care to admit, and a lot of this research is because I have friends who provide for their families on the land crab fishery, and I would like for them to be able to continue to do that well into the future. So certainly, thank I am very indebted to them. Um, additionally, funding sources at my college and the field stations that have been very gracious in providing accommodations and field assistance for me um, and my own children who have been incredibly accommodating and very helpful in collecting data not only for the genetic component of my um, research but also um, the crab pen harvest study. <laughs>